All right, a more perfect view, the pursuit of perfection in Christ. This is lesson five in the series, based off Galatians 5. So let's review what we have learned so far. Go over these terms once again. There is perfection in two senses uh, referred to in the Bible, two ways. The Bible talks about perfection. One, as I mentioned, conditional perfection, which is the perfection that, uh, the perfection of Christ rather, that God sees in all those who are saved by faith in Jesus. The perfection that Jesus has is imputed upon us through faith in Christ. Whenever God looks at us, considers us, judges us, that's the important thing, this is the state that He sees us in because of our faith in, in Jesus. He sees conditional perfection. And then there's actual perfection, which is the character of Christ we pursue through the Holy Spirit as a witness before others and as praise to God as believers. We are able to confidently pursue actual perfection because we already possess conditional perfection. Sometimes difficult to hold both those ideas in our minds at the same time. So in the title, you know, the more perfect you mentioned in the title is a reference to the actual perfection that Christians diligently seek through the Holy Spirit. In other words, the conditionally perfect ones are seeking more perfection. They're seeking actual perfection by living according to the influence or the fruit, if you wish, of the Holy Spirit. And so in this way, the perfect seek more perfection. The perfect seek more perfection. Now the key passage that the series is based on comes near the end of the epistle of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 5, 13 to 25. So in the book of Galatians, Paul is refuting false teachers who were attacking this very principle of perfection in God's eyes by faith. That's what was being attacked. Their teaching proposed that conditional perfection could be kept only if the Galatians adhered to certain rules about food, certain laws based in the Old Testament, and the keeping of certain rituals, the most important of which was circumcision. They were saying, yeah, yeah, you can stay perfect before God, but in order to really be a true Christian, to be saved, you have to add these things, chief of which was circumcision. So what they were proposing in reality was the pursuing of conditional perfection by the keeping of the law. So Paul responds by denouncing these teachers and their doctrines and reassuring the Galatians that their perfect standing with God, salvation, was securely anchored in their faith in Jesus Christ and nothing and no one else. I'm saved because I believe in Jesus, period. As for the practice of their lives, he encourages them not to pursue law keeping, but rather pursue a walk with the Spirit as a defining mark of their conditional perfection. You want to demonstrate that, that you are conditionally perfect, that you're saved, and honor God in the process, well then pursue a walk with the Spirit. You see, I've told you that God is the one who sees conditional perfection. Man, however, sees actual perfection, and this is the witness uh, that what is unseen actually exists. How does somebody know that you're a saved person? Well, they see, they see actual perfection. You're pursuing actual perfection. You're producing the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of the Spirit cannot be produced by works of the law, cannot be produced by fleshly habits, certainly not by following after what Satan you know, gives us to do. Fruit of the Spirit is only produced by walking by the Spirit. And so in Galatians 5, Paul describes the nature of one who walks in the Spirit, the characteristics of those whose conditional perfection in Christ is cultivated by God to produce spiritual fruit in the physical man woman. 
So in order to do this, he sets up a comparison between what is clearly of this earth, what is of this flesh, so that the things of the spiritual, conditionally perfect man can be more clearly defined and understood. If you want to see what the fruit of the spirit is, you first have to recognize what the fruit of the flesh is. Once you see what the fruit of the flesh is, it'd be easy to, to spot the fruit of the spirit. So this is what the look of imperfection looks like. Now this entire series has discussed the idea of perfection in its various forms. Again, as I said, in order to contrast these, Paul will begin first to describe what the imperfect looks like. And he uses the term flesh and fleshly, not to say that all flesh is bad. That was a Greek idea. That was a dualism in Greek philosophy. They believed that all flesh, everything physical was bad. And you had to escape this you know, evil thing you know, by keeping certain laws and rules and secret knowledge and so on and so forth. That that comes from the flesh is imperfect. And Paul will note some of the more imperfect things that the flesh produces. So in chapter five, verse 16, he says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. If we're using the language that we're using in this class, we would say, then pursue actual perfection, and you won't carry out the works of imperfection. I'm just substituting language to give us a way to look at this from another angle, that's all. So this is a summary reference to what he has talked about so far concerning false teachers what they were trying to teach and what this was leading to. Division and pride and strife, those are things of the flesh, they're not things of the spirit. You know, if you're in a church where the elders are fighting with one another and, and the preacher is at odds with the other preachers and the, uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've got cliques in the church and so on, I mean, all those things tell us, wow, that, that church, you know, there's not a lot of spiritual fruit being produced by that church, something's wrong somewhere. But where there's harmony, where the brethren love each other, where they support one another, where they encourage one another, where there's respect for the leadership of the, the, the shepherds and where the deacons are doing their work and so on and so forth. Well, there's something good there. The Spirit's working. I always say, you know, when, when someone is baptized, you know, when, people, when people go forward and, and go into the water, the Spirit is at work in that church. When people say, you know, I've, I've visited here and there, but I want to be part of this congregation. I want to be a member here. The Spirit is at work. Those are not works of the flesh. Nobody confesses Christ and, and receives baptism because it's a work of the flesh. It beca it's because the Spirit is working. Okay. The desire of the flesh is imperfection. If one desires the things of the Spirit, he or she will desire actual perfection. And even if it isn't achieved perfectly, the thing itself is perfect. You know, some people, you know, if you're online, and you know, if you teach here, well, you know, there's 40, 50 people that can give you a, some feedback. Some agree, some may disagree, some may have a question. <laughs> We've learned the hard way that when you go online and there's a couple of hundred thousand people, there's a lot more you know, questions and comments. And when people are writing to you online, they're not as polite as when they're talking to you face to face. <laughs> when they want to criticize you online, believe me, they don't hold back. And so sometimes the criticism is the Church of Christ. Oh, you people in the Church of Christ, you know, whatever. You're a bunch of legalists, or you do this, or I, you know, I went to a Church of Christ once and I was treated badly, so therefore the 13,000 other congregations in, in the United States are all like that one? Like that particular preacher or that particular elder that you didn't get along with, or that particular member, that person speaks for you know, the, the million, the, the million and a half, two million others? My answer is, I'm not saying that you know, in the churches of Christ there's perfection. 
My answer is I'm a member of the Church of Christ. I believe in the restoration movement because we have the right goal. We have the right target. We're shooting at the correct thing. What is that? To restore biblical Christianity, to follow only the New Testament in establishing, maintaining, organizing, functioning as a church. You, you show me a better target. So it's the same thing, you know, that's, that's corporately. I, I believe in the idea of the restoration and the way that we pursue it corporately because it's the right goal, it's a biblical goal. Individually, the pursuit of actual perfection in our day to day life, we don't actually get to achieve it, but it's the right goal. We're pursuing perfection, the right kind of perfection. We're not pursuing imperfection. So Paul says that the very act of desiring the things of the spirit, the perfect things of actual perfection, will eliminate imperfect things being created and promoted by the flesh and the world. You cancel one by putting the other in. Didn't Jesus say that? You know? The spirit's cast out of you, and what happens? If you just stay like that, you know, he says seven spirits will come back and the, the, the latter state will be worse than the former state. Well, it's the same thing. I pursue actual perfection and every step I take in that direction, I'm eliminating something because I've just got enough capacity, spiritual capacity to hold, let's say, 50 things. I don't know, you know let's just say 50 things. I, I've got spiritual capacity for 50 units. Every time I let go a flesh unit, a sin unit, and I replace it with a spirit unit, well, that's good, I'm, that's how I make the progress. James refers to this idea in James 3, 13 to 18, when he talks about the wisdom from above versus the wisdom from below. It's always the same message, brothers and sisters. Just like I'm doing, you know, I'm giving different words, actual, you know, conditional, just to kind of look at it from another perspective, well, they do the same thing. So it's a decision every Christian must make because even though we are perfect in Christ, you come, again, you come out of the waters of baptism, you're never any more saved than you are at that moment, never. It's done, you're justified, there is no more. You can't get more perfect than the conditional perfection imputed on you through faith expressed in repentance and baptism. You can't get more saved. We're talking about lifestyle here. We're talking about maintaining that. So it's a decision every Christian must make because even though we are perfect in Christ, a condition we have received by choosing to believe and obey Christ, we can still choose to reject Him by choosing to pursue imperfection, which is the flesh, instead of pursuing perfection which is the spirit. So Paul's point and my point is that we choose to believe in order to be saved. And then we must continue to choose to walk in the spirit in order to remain saved and grow. Or as our series would say it, we chose to receive conditional perfection. We must also choose to pursue actual perfection to maintain our conditional perfection. And this is where many theologians disagree. Right here, this is, this is the dividing line between most theologians within Christianity. Our Baptist and Evangelical, Pentecostal, Protestant friends, not, not 100%, but most of them, they believe that once you have conditional perfection, there is nothing you can do, there is no choice you can make or not make that can change this. They believe that once you receive conditional perfection, that's it, the game is over, you're saved forever. If you, if, if you were baptized when you were 10 years old and you lived to 100, nothing you did between the ages of 10 and 100, nothing, good or bad, that you can do can cause you to lose that. Don't go to church, whatever. Dump your spouse and run off with somebody else. Yeah, not a good thing, but yeah. And some people say, well, you're exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating, that's what you teach. 
Once you're saved, you're always saved, irregardless of what you do. We, the New Testament churches, and we're not the only ones that teach this, but we, we are you know, part of the ones that teach this idea. We believe that what Paul says here in Galatians speaks directly to this issue. He is speaking to Christians who obviously are saved and they have conditional perfection, and yet what does he do? He warns them to choose to walk by the spirit and not the flesh or else suffer the consequences. Well, that doesn't sound like once saved, always saved to me. I certainly couldn't create that doctrine from this scripture. So once we have salvation, once we are considered perfect by God, we can, and here's the caveat, by our own choices, we can still reject this and lose what was freely given to us. This is why this passage is so important. It's, it's not just a suggestion or a helpful hint, it is the continuation of our response to God's offer of salvation. It's because we tend to compartmentalize our religion. Yeah, when were you saved? Well, back in 1949, you know, I did this and you know, the river was cold, but me and the preacher went down to the river and I was baptized and I was saved and that was it. That, and they, that, there's that box with a date on it. That's not how salvation works. Salvation is a lifetime process. It may have begun in 1949 in the Wachita River on a cold uh, you know, September. It might have started there, but it continues on throughout your entire life. That's the process of, that's why I always use the term, the process of salvation. This is why, as I say, this passage is important. At first, we choose to believe in Christ to re receive conditional perfection, and then we choose to walk in the Spirit to witness and maintain that conditional perfection. Now this would be just another form of law keeping if it were not for important differences. And this is another point I'm making. Uh, I get lots of mail on this and lots of you know, comments on this because they say, you're just preaching a law, you know, a law type of salvation. Or now they have a new term for it, I guess. It's not supposed to be pejorative, but it is. And say, oh, you're, you're, preaching a, you're preaching a discipleship salvation. I'd never heard that before. I'm thinking, really, is that what I'm doing? <laughs> In other words, you, know, you got to do this, you got to do that you know, to remain saved. In other words, it's a burden. And I, I can see how someone you know, might say that if it weren't for the important differences that I want to point out. In other words, pursuing actual perfection would in essence be some kind of law keeping activity as was proposed by the false teachers. You know, they taught that you had to follow rituals and rules and laws to maintain that perfection, to maintain that salvation. Wasn't Paul simply replacing these uh, with character traits and moral habits that you had to have in order to keep your salvation? I mean, if, you know, if we're going to build a straw man, let's build a really strong straw man. If we're going to present the counter argument of others, come on, let's really present, because that's their argument. All this business about doing your best and cultivating, isn't that just a form of law keeping? except instead of a ritual, you put in place some moral habit? Well, this would be actual law keeping if it wasn't for the following. First of all, the things that are pursued are perfect. The false teachers offered ideas of men, imperfect ways to achieve actual perfection. Paul tells them that what they will pursue is perfect, it's spiritual, it's from above, and therefore it's worthy of their effort. You see, what once saved, always saved is, is salvation with zero effort. Salvation with the zero input. It doesn't matter what you do. God has chosen you and that's it. You know, you're done.
the things pursued are from God. Yeah, it would be law keeping if it wasn't for the fact that the things that we've been given, you know, to walk by the Spirit, they've been given to us by God Himself. The principle of law keeping to attain perfection or to maintain it was a human and thus an imperfect system that would not work. The teaching that conditional perfection was bestowed as a gift from God and received by faith, that's, that's from God. The teaching that conditional perfection was maintained by pursuing actual perfection, in other words, by walking by the Spirit, this also is from God and thus could achieve its desired results. If God says to me, salvation comes by faith and is maintained by walking by the Spirit, Brothers and sisters, that's how it is. You can call it whatever you want to disparage it, to discourage it. Paul is not proposing another form of law keeping. Walking by the spirit, or actual perfection, is not a form of law keeping. Law keeping says that if you abide by these rules, you receive the prize. You can count, you can measure, you can compare. This is why it leads to pride and division and discouragement. Walking by the Spirit, on the other hand, is not law keeping because it is the Spirit that does the work for you, not you yourself. The part that you contribute to actual perfection is the same part that you contribute to conditional perfection. In conditional perfection you believe and you submit to Christ and you express your faith, but it is Christ who earns and bestows the perfection on you. I believe in Jesus, I repent, I'm baptized, but who's the one that earned, who earned that salvation for me? It's Him. He's the one who lived a perfect life according to the law and offered that perfect life on behalf of me. He did the work. I'm simply receiving what He's given me through faith. And I express the faith in the way that He has commanded, repentance and baptism. In actual perfection, the same thing happens. You believe, you submit to the Holy Spirit, you continue to express your faith. How? Through worship, through service, through fellowship, through learning, through the sharing of your faith. But it is the Holy Spirit who creates in you the character of Christ. That's why I say salvation is a process. The first step is acknowledging Christ and making the choice to do away with sin and submitting to baptism. Those are the first steps, but they're not the last steps. You just keep going. You keep going. So if walking in the spirit were a form of law keeping, then you yourself, through self-will and practice and self-denial and human effort, you would be producing the characteristics that Paul describes later on. To be sure, in the world there are many methods and remedies and gurus who promise a form of these things. This is the imperfect, fleshly, law-keeping method of self-improvement. Oprah! <laughs> it's the Oprah method. Uh, you know, I'm not criticizing Oprah, she does what she does, but it's the you can do it method. It's the believe in your heart and it will happen method. It's the you can do anything you want to do uh, method. And sometimes I sit there, you know, and when I hear this coming out of somebody's mouth, you know, usually uh, at awards night somewhere, you know, I'm thinking, well, you, you haven't lived long enough yet. You're going to find out in life, you can't do it. <laughs> or it's awfully hard to do it. Or it's hard to consistently do it. And if you follow just your heart, you're going to be in trouble you know, eventually. You're going to get into trouble if you follow just your heart. But walking by the Spirit is not about you. It's about the Spirit creating his own, in His own time and way in your believing and submitted heart the person and the character of Christ as a witness to yourself and others that you are indeed one of the perfect ones. How else and what else could explain the change in character that you now have? 
Every Christian I talk to, and I ask them, you know, is there a big difference between you now and you when you first became a Christian? Oh yeah, oh my, oh. <laughs> yeah, you should have known me back then, they say. You wouldn't recognize, you wouldn't recognize me. So in verse 17 and 18, same passage, knowing these things helps us understand the following two verses where Paul talks about the dynamics of the imperfect and perfect at work in the very same person. So we read in verse 17, 18 there in Galatians. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. So the possession and knowledge of our conditional perfection moves us to draw nearer to God and to draw nearer to godly things. I am perfect, therefore I want to live and breathe the perfect air that my salvation brings me. And so the Holy Spirit rebuilds the imperfect man into the image of Christ as a response to this desire triggered by the knowledge of and the possession of salvation. I'm saved, what now? You know, somebody comes out of the water and there's a, you know, the excitement and happiness and relief, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, that's great. You know, and the, by the time your hair dries and you sit down and you have a prayer and you go home and you're by yourself and you're thinking and the question arises, okay, I'm saved, what now? What do I do now? And the answer to that question, begin walking by the Spirit. That's what's now. You couldn't walk by the Spirit before because you didn't have the Spirit. You were lost. You were fleshly. You were following the dictates of your flesh. You were following your heart. But now, now that you're saved, now that God considers you perfect, what do I do now? Yeah, begin walking by the Spirit. Why? Because you'll be tempted to go back to the old ways. That blush of excitement and happiness and joy and relief, that'll kind of, you know, that'll calm itself down as life returns. As someone at work does, a, does you a dirty deed or something, or you're, you know, some mechanic somewhere you know, spoils your car or ruins your transmission, you know what I'm saying? all of a sudden life will just kind of go back to quote normal. And you will be tempted to go back to being quote normal. So as I say, the spirit rebuilds the imperfect man into the image of Christ as a response to this desire, triggered by the knowledge of and possession, I have salvation, what now? Well, walk by the Spirit now. Why? Because man is still contained and trapped in an imperfect flesh that resides in an imperfect world, that's why. The willingness is there, the desire is there, the spiritual agent is there, but the imperfection of the flesh is also there, blocking, fighting, resisting perfection. You say to your flesh, boy, I'm, I'm going to get rid of this and I'm, I'm stopping that and I'm giving up this and your flesh answers back over my dead body, you will. <laughs> over my dead body, you will. You want to fight? I'll show you fight. You want to follow after the spirit? I'll show you what pain is all about. I'll show you what misery is all about. I'll show you what the world is all about. What does Peter say? He who has uh, abandoned sin has begun to suffer. So long as you're you know, in the sin, enjoying the sin, contemplating the sin, keeping the sin close by, Satan won't bother you. But the day you decide, okay, that's enough for you, that's it, that's all, uh-oh. You know, it's as if a, a work order, <laughs> a work order is written up and sent to one of the demons saying, okay, you know, that Paul guy, he said he was giving up this, you know, uh, let's mobilize a, a posse and go down there and you know, show them what, what's going to cost them. 
So this is why I call it actual perfection, because it's the degree of perfection that you actually attain in the flesh, not the completed perfection already given and seen by God in heaven, seen because God sees the end and not just the present. So the two merge into one at resurrection where the flesh and sin melt away never to interfere with perfection again. I think another way of talking about heaven is all the things that you desire and want to be in Christ, you will be. Every time you glimpse the perfect you that you so want to be, you will have that in heaven. We will have that in heaven. So Paul explains that the Spirit's work is limited by the material he's working with. The human flesh, the fallen nature. Imperfection does not reign supreme. However, neither is perfection perfected in the flesh. This is going to happen later. The result, however, is that those who walk by the Spirit, in other words, they choose to pursue actual perfection, are no longer judged by a system of law. That's why he says we're free from the law. I, God's not going to judge me by the law. He's going to judge me by the gospel. Those who rejected the gospel, they're going to be judged by the law. And we know what the result of that's going to be. But we, we will be judged by the gospel. You know that passage where it says, you know, we'll be judged for everything we've ever said? We'll be known? Think about that. Think of the things you've thought of and said. Imagine. Except for Christians. The only words that will be revealed about what Christians said are, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Those are the only words. Those words cancel out every other word. Those words cancel out every other thought. <coughs> the result is that those who walk by the Spirit are no longer judged by a system of law. In other words, walking by the Spirit is not a form of law keeping as I explained before. Now why is this important? It's important because if walking by the Spirit were another form of law keeping, the measure of success would be perfection. You'd have to achieve it. This would mean that in order to succeed, walking by the Spirit in an acceptable way, a person would have to walk by the Spirit perfectly. I mean, if it was a form of law keeping. Without error, without ever falling back, always completely enlightened, always completely devoted. Since we're imperfect to begin with, of course, this would be impossible, impossible. But those who are led by the Spirit are not under the law and have two advantages. Advantage number one, no judgment. They're not judged at all because through faith in Christ they have already been judged according to the law and have been found perfect with the perfection of Christ. And secondly, they're no longer pursuing earthly, fleshly things which can be measured and judged and condemned. They are pursuing heavenly things, spiritual things, perfect things led by God's Spirit. And so those who are conditionally perfect through Christ are, and pursuing actual perfection through the Holy Spirit are no longer subject to the law and are beyond judgment because they have been put in a place to judge and condemn the imperfect, not the perfect. So let's summarize. The desire of the flesh is imperfection. The product of the flesh is imperfection. Those who desire imperfection are evident by their imperfect works, which Paul describes in verse 19. Law keeping does not and cannot produce perfection. As a matter of fact, when one pursues perfection through law keeping, the result is pride and lies and envy and division and strife. The law was given simply to point out sin and the degree of sin 
and the consequences of sin. That was the purpose of the law. No one ever achieved perfection by pursuing the law. It's not the way to do it. As I just said, the law was given to reveal imperfection, to judge it and to condemn it, not to produce perfection. And then, God, excuse me, God's help through the Holy Spirit is a taste of that perfection received by faithful living or what the Bible calls fruit of the Spirit and what I refer to as actual perfection. Well, why? So someone says, okay, I understand. I'm considered perfect, okay. So now what do I do? Uh, I say walk by the Spirit. That's, that's your lifestyle as a Christian. In other words, pursue actual perfection. Okay, all right. And so I'm pursuing actual perfection. Is the only, is the only uh, 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 result of that, or the only uh, spin-off benefit of that, that I manage to keep my salvation? Because somehow I, I understand that that's a worthy thing. I want to maintain my salvation, but somehow I got to have more than just that because maintaining my salvation, you know what, I don't know, you know I, that's so far ahead, that's up in heaven. You know, it's like I can't get my, I can't get my, I can't get my mind around all. Is there another benefit to this? Yeah, there is another benefit to walking by the Spirit. The other benefit is you, you actually, in this physical life, get a taste of what heaven is like. A little taste of what heaven is like. When you actually experience that peace that surpasses understanding while you are going through a storm, that peace that surpasses understanding, that's, that's a little taste of, of heaven. When you're able to reconcile yourself with someone else and you forgive one another and you weep and you pray for one another and you reestablish a, a friendship or relationship you know, and oh, the great relief that comes from that, you know, that's just a little taste of, of heaven. So why am I, what, what, is there another practical reason why I'm pursuing actual perfection? Absolutely, I want to have a glimpse of heaven. That glimpse of heaven keeps me going, keeps me motivated, makes me anxious for the day. How, how, how else does Paul in prison, ready to be uh, executed, with all the suffering that he went through, how else could he be anxious to get, let's, let's get it out, you know, come on, cut off my head, you know, let's go, let's get this done, why? Well that man, that Christian man, he, he, he had a taste, of, didn't he say, uh, I knew a man, he was caught up into the third heaven or something, right? He had a vision of heaven, Paul had a vision of heaven. So he wasn't worried about this world, Right. For, to, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. I'm a, I'm a winner either way. And we all can be winners either way. We can live here and yet have a glimpse of heaven knowing where we're going. I hope no one here ever, if, if they're ever asked, uh, so are you going to heaven? There'll be no pause. There'll be no, um, well, let me add up the, let me add, a, let me add the score up. <laughs> I want us to say, of course I'm going to heaven. I've even seen a little bit of what it's like and I'm anxious to go. All right, we continue with this next week. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>